Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for standing by, and welcome to the Moreo Biopharma 2020 Interim Results Conference Call. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode. Later, we will conduct a question and answer session, and instructions will follow at that time. It is now my pleasure to turn the call over to Steve Class, Vice President with Burns McClellan. Please go ahead, sir. Thank you, Operator. Good morning, everyone. Good afternoon to those of you in the U.K., and thank you for joining Moreo's 2020 Interim Financial Results and Corporate Update Conference Call. Earlier today, the company issued a press release providing an overview of recent business progress as well as financial results for the six months and the June 30th, 2020. This press release may be accessed on the investors portion of Moreo's website at www.moreobiopharma.com. Leading the call today will be Dr. Denise Scott Knight, Mario's Chief Executive Officer, who will provide a summary of the company's recent clinical and corporate developments. Afterward, Michael Wisga, Interim CFO of Mario, will provide a brief overview of the financial highlights for the six months and the June 30th, 2020. We will then open the line for questions. Dr. John Lewicki, Mario's Chief Scientific Officer, will also be available for Q&A. As a reminder, the discussion today will contain forward-looking statements. These statements are based on assumptions as of the current date and involve risks and uncertainties that could cause actual results to differ materially from these statements. We caution you to consider the important risk factors that could cause the actual results to differ materially from those in the forward-looking statements in the press release and this conference call. These risk factors are described in today's press release and are more fully detailed under the caption risk factors in filings with the SEC. In addition, please note the date of this conference call is September 29, 2020, and any forward-looking statements that are made today are based on assumptions that we believe to be reasonable as of the state. The company undertakes no obligation to update these statements as a result of new information or future events. I will now turn the call over to Denise. Thank you, Steve, and thank you to everyone for joining us today. It's a pleasure to welcome all of you to our 2020 Interim Financial Results and the Business Update Conference Call. This is a very exciting time for Moreo. We've made substantial progress over the course of 2020, including our change in strategy to focus on advancing the development of etigilimab, our anti antibody, with potential broad utilization in oncology alongside our rare disease product portfolio. In June of this year, we also closed a $70 million financing with leading U.S. institutional investors to further advance etigilimab alongside our rare disease product portfolio. We believe this financing has left us well capitalized to execute on our strategy. I'm pleased to share with you today a review of our recent progress, as well as to outline the opportunities we have in front of us as we enter the fourth quarter of 2020 and prepare for an eventful 2021, which we believe will help catalyze the next stage of Morea's growth. Let me first begin with etigilimab. As I mentioned, etigilimab is a novel antibody against TIGIT a next-generation checkpoint receptor shown to block T-cell activation and the body's natural anti-cancer immune response. Specifically, etigilimab is an IgG1 monoclonal antibody which binds to the human TIGIT receptor on immune cells with the goal of improving the activation and effectiveness of T-cell and NK-cell anti-tumor activity. We believe etigilimab is competitive with other antitigit approaches as it is a novel IgG1 with both inhibitory as well as ADCC characteristics having an intact effector function. As part of our clinical development strategy, we plan to focus the development of etigilimab on tumor types with high PDL1 and TIGIT expression with poor responses to anti pdl one or PDL, PD-1, and on tumor types where we saw evidence of responses in our Phase 1A, 1B studies. Etigilimab has completed a Phase 1A dose escalation trial in patients with advanced solid tumors, and patients were also enrolled in a Phase 1B study in combination with nivolumab in select tumor types. 
In the Phase 1A dose escalation study, 23 patients with multiple tumor types were enrolled and no dose limiting toxicities were observed. In the Phase 1B combination study, a total of 10 patients with multiple tumor types, nine of whom had progressed on prior anti-PD-1 or PDL one therapies were enrolled. Eight patients were evaluable for tumor growth assessment, and all of these patients had progressed on prior PD-1 or PDL one therapies, with best responses including two patients with a partial response and stable disease. Patients remained on study for up to 224 days, and similar to the Phase 1A study, no dose-limiting toxicities were observed. As many of you are aware, interest in anti tidget approaches has been very strong, and this is a rapidly evolving landscape in oncology. Tidget's role in tumor immunosurveillance is analogous to the PD-1, PD-L1 axis in tumor immunosuppression. Based on preclinical studies, both TIGIT and PD-L1 are upregulated in a variety of different cancers. Data show that combination therapy using anti-TIGIT and PD-L1 or PD-1 antibodies conferred greater responses than anti-PD-L1 or PD-1 treatment alone, implying a synergistic mechanism following interruption of these two inhibitory checkpoints. Our phase 1B2 will be a combination of etigilimab with an anti-PD-1 in a range of tumor types in 75 to 100 patients, and this will include a cohort of rare tumor types. Initiation of this study remains on track for the fourth quarter, and we plan to host a webinar teaching in the fourth quarter to share more details about our program and the phase one, two combination study design. Assuming this study initiates as planned in the fourth quarter, we expect to be in a position to report the first clinical data starting mid-2021. We're very enthusiastic about the potential for this program. I'd like to now turn to our rare disease portfolio, which includes cetruzumab for the treatment of osteogenesis imperfecta, or OI, as well as alveolostat for the treatment of severe alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency and other potential indications, including COVID-19 respiratory disease. Before I spend a few minutes discussing these programs in greater detail, I also wanted to note that our product portfolio includes lefloutrazole for hypogonadotrophic hypogonadism, as well as acumapimod for acute exacerbations of COPD, or AECOPD. As many of you know, we have previously generated positive phase two data in both of these indications, and partnering discussions for leflutrazole and acumapimab um, are well underway. Turning to our rare disease portfolio, in late 2019, we announced positive top-line results from the phase 2B asteroid study with cetruzumab. This was the largest investigational clinical study that has ever been conducted in adult OI patients in the US and EU. As a reminder, cetruzumab is a human monoclonal antibody targeting sclerostin. We believe this mechanism is particularly well suited to treat OI because unlike other agents which are either anabolic or anti-resorptive, cetruzumab has been demonstrated to be a strong bone building agent that also reduces the resorption of bone, creating a dual action anabolic effect to build overall bone density. The phase 2B asteroid study demonstrated a very clear dose dependent bone building effect of cetruzumab. There are currently no FDA or EMA approved therapies for OI. Osteogenesis imperfecta is particularly devastating for children and their families and has a significant impact on the quality of life for adult patients 
who can also fracture frequently and very often suffer, suffer chronic pain. In recognition of this unmet need, Citruzumab has received prime designation by the European Medicines Agency and has also been granted orphan drug status by both the EMA and the FDA. Just last week, we announced that Citruzumab received rare pediatric disease designation from the FDA. We believe this further highlights the significant unmet medical need facing children with OI and underscores the potential of citrusumab to become the first approved treatment option specifically for these patients. With the receipt of rare disease pediatric designation, we may also be eligible to receive a priority review voucher from the FDA. Following our regulatory discussions earlier this year, we're also pleased that both the FDA and EMA have agreed on the principles of a design of a single phase three pivotal pediatric study in OI. We believe there's a clear path forward for citruzumab in OI and are discussing, continuing discussions with potential partners prior to the initiation of the phase three study consistent with our strategy. These potential partnerships include a range of different structures uh, with Moreo retaining commercial rights in certain regions. We very much look forward to updating you on these discussions in due course. Turning to our VWSTAT, we're pleased to have resumed enrollment in our ongoing phase two proof of concept study in patients with severe alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency lung disease following a pause due to COVID-19 earlier in the year. Top line data from this study now remains on track for the second half of next year, 2021. Alveolostat is a small molecule that inhibits neutrophil elastase. Neutrophil elastase is an enzyme that attacks and progressively damages lung tissue. AATD patients either lack the protective alpha-1 antitrypsin protein or produce a small amount of abnormal, ineffective protein that cannot, cannot reach the lung and fails to block uh, neutrophil elastase from tissue destruction. Such patients suffer progressive lung deterioration leading to cough, wheeze, COPD-like symptoms, and ultimately reliance on respiratory support. Some patients actually go on to receive lung transplants. The primary endpoint for our 12-week proof of concept study is based on the biomarker desmosine, which is a breakdown product of elastin, the target of neutrophil elastase. If the results demonstrate a positive impact on the blockade of neutrophil elastase, we intend to seek regulatory guidance in both the EU and the US on the design of a pivotal trial in both territories and to commence this as soon as possible thereafter. The only approved therapy for AATD is plasma-derived protein. However, this is not reimbursed and not available for use in all territories. In August, we also announced the initiation of a phase 1B2 placebo-controlled study to evaluate the safety and efficacy of alveolostat in hospitalized adult patients with moderate to severe COVID respiratory disease. This is due to the underlying mechanism of alveolostat, and we believe there's a rationale for blocking neutrophil elastase in these patients. This trial is led by Dr. Michael Wells and will be conducted at the University of Alabama. Approximately 15 patients will be randomized to receive either alveolostat plus standard of care or placebo plus standard of care for 10 days. The primary endpoint is safety and tolerability of alveolostat at day, at day 10 with a safety follow-up to day 90. Additional endpoints include blood biomarkers and oxygen deficit at day 10. The, the trial will also assess clinical outcomes, including effect on 
disease progression measured by the need for respiratory support and disease severity using the WHO 9-point ordinal score at day 29. We look forward to working closely with our colleagues at the University of Alabama to investigate alveolostat in this patient population and to complete this study as rapidly as possible to help with the ongoing effort to solve the global COVID-19 crisis. In addition, as part of our broader development plans for alveolostat, we're continuing to support certain investigator-led studies including the Atlanta study into AAD, AATD, led by Mark Dransfield and his team, which is financially supported by an NCATS grant, and also a study into bronchiolitis obliterans, or BOS, associated with graft versus host disease in patients receiving hemopoietic stem cell transplantation, which is led by Steve Poletic at the NIH. BOS is an orphan disease characterized by inflammatory obstruction of the lung's tiniest airways and is the primary cause of death in patients who receive lung transplants. We're excited about the potential broad utilization of alveolostat and look forward to reporting data from these studies. Before I turn the call over to Mike to review the financials, I also want to acknowledge the appointments of Dr. Brian Schwartz, former Chief Medical Officer of Arcule, and Dr. Jeremy Bender, former Vice President of Corporate Development at Gilead Sciences, and recently appointed CEO of Day One Biopharmaceuticals to our Board of Directors. Brian and Jeremy are industry veterans with deep experience in clinical and corporate development specifically within oncology and rare diseases. Their collective skill sets will be a real asset to Moreo as we continue to advance our programs and our business strategy. I'll now turn the call over to Mike. Thank you, Denise, and good morning, everyone. I'd like to spend a few minutes giving an overview of the finances for the period. During the past six months, ending on June 30th, 2020, our R&D expenditures fell by 3.4 million pounds from the prior year to 8.5 million pounds in total. During this year, we continued our development in our two rare disease assets, centrusumab and alveolostat, with expenditures for the adult phase 2B study in centrusumab and the proof of concept study phase 2 in alveolostat. In the same period of last year, our R&D expense was focused on centrusumab, again in the adult Phase 2B study, as well as the completion of the Phase 2 studies in our specialty products, Acumatabob and Lefutrasol. Lefut sorry. Um, Lefutrasol. Um, again, in the period, our administrative expenses increased by 1.3 million pounds to 8.2 million pounds from the 6.9 million pounds in 2019. This increase was predominantly caused by the one-off legal and professional fees, which increased by about 900,000 pounds. Our underlying administrative expenses without these one-offs were 4.9 million pounds compared to the 5.3 million pounds in 2019. So basically, there were no changes in our administrative expenses. With regard to our cash, we started the year with 16.3 million pounds in cash and short-term deposits. And as Denise mentioned, on June 4th of 2020, the company announced the completion of a 56 million pound or $70 million fundraising. Net of transaction costs, this amount was 51.4 million pounds or $64.2 million. After the expenditures in the first half of the year, we ended the period with cash and short-term deposits of 56.8 million pounds. Now, given our cash position at the end of the year and our current forecast, we are now well-funded into uh, 2022. This provides the company with sufficient runway to deliver both on our clinical programs as well as deliver on our business development milestones. Now I'd like to turn it back over to the operator so we can take any questions. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, to ask a question, you will need to press star 1 on your telephone. To withdraw your question, press the pound key. Stand, please stand by while we compile the Q&A roster. Our first question comes from Joseph Schwartz with the SVV Leland. Your line is open. 
Hi, thanks uh, so much, and congrats on all the progress. A couple questions on Avelostat. Um, I was wondering, in terms of the COVID work, um, how should what, what's the time frame that uh, we should uh, think about um, when that data might become available? That's the first question. And then in um, alpha one antitrypsin, I was wondering, you know, what um, change in desmosine or isodesmosine are you hoping to see? in that phase three trial, and then where would Elvelostat fit into the treatment landscape as it currently exists, as well as how it's evolving with uh, some potential um, new uh, treatment modalities? Okay. Um, so in terms of, uh, thanks, Joe, and uh, thanks for your comments and your questions. Uh, great to hear you. So in terms of the, um, the alveolostat data uh, in our COVID study, we expect to um, be reporting that mid-year, um, probably sometime in, in, the, in the second quarter is our current expectation. Great, thank you. And then, and then in, okay. in terms of the core work for alveolostat, just, yeah, um, I think you got the question, but if, if you need, I can reprise it. Uh, no, it's fine. I've got it. Thank you. Um, so in terms of um, the desmosine, so uh, the study's power to, sh to show um, a 6% or greater change uh, in the levels of desmosine. And, you know, why did we choose that? Well, we chose that because that's correlated um, back to changes in lung density uh, via CT scan data. Um, so that's why we chose that level. In terms of um, the treatment landscape, so so a couple of a couple of points there. Um, obviously, our study is uh, alveolostat as a, a monotherapy. Um, I mentioned the NCAP study, and um, with that study, we are now going um, on top. In fact, um, of the um, of alpha-1 antitrypsin therapy. Um, it's believed that the alpha-1 antitrypsin uh, therapy is um, being given at lower therapeutic levels um, than the patients could actually benefit from. So we are actually doing a study um, looking at alveolostat on top of alpha-1. In terms of the recent developments, you know, across the landscape, um, clearly, you know, um, the likes of, of Arrowhead are, um, you know, those are looking at the, clearly at the liver disease, um, and we're very focused on, on the lung disease, so we think those sit alongside each other. Mm -hmm. Okay, that makes sense. Okay. Thanks for taking my question. Okay. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm sure no further questions. This concludes today's call. You may now disconnect.